if you've been joining us for the past three or four months, we've been in the book of John. Next week, we're going to hit a Christmas story, but I don't feel led to leave where we've been for the last three weeks, counting this week in particular. We started a series on hope two Sundays ago, talking about the different hope we find in the John 11 uh, chapter of the Bible, where Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. If you remember, we talked about three different groups that you find where Jesus interacts with in this passage. Number one being the disciples. He taught them how to evangelize. Remember the statement? Let's go. Wake them up. And we talked to our church about how God has called us as a generation to wake up a lost and dying world to the truth of God. Last week, we talked about Mary and Martha. Remember Mary and Martha were the people who had someone who was suffering, had someone who died. And we used this analogy and brought the spiritual truth in that many places in our world, we are dealing with people constantly that are hurting. How many of you have recognized that depression is way higher than it used to be in our society? Uh, And maybe it's way higher because it's more talked about, right? Um, Anxiety, way higher. How many of you would be honest and say you maybe even experience a little more anxiety than you used to? Anybody like that? Slip a hand up, I'll raise mine. Um, You know, I'll be honest, there's an ongoing battle with depression in our lives if we're not careful. You can be happy in one area of your life and totally empty on another area of your life, totally in the dark. Hey, I believe this. We are living in a lost generation. Would you agree? We're living in a world that is moving away from God. You know, we're in the UK. It is now Christianity is in the minority of religion, and every other religion is increasing by the year while Christianity is dying. By the way, can I say that? That same trend is happening here in America. It's not just in the UK. And as we look at that, we realize that as the name of God is removed from our society, there's names of other gods that pop up. Maybe you've heard this name, opiates. Anybody heard of that? Pills, all right? Um, What about cocaine, alcohol, porn? Have we heard these names? And you say, you're calling them gods? No, they're not the God, but they're becoming the gods of our lives. They're becoming the focus. What about gossip? I mean, can you even turn on your news without gossip? Can you get on your social media without gossip? I mean, it is there and it is rampant. And so today, last week, I invited you to invite anyone that you knew that may be living in an afflicted lifestyle. Let's define that. <clears throat> that's a lifestyle that may have been hurt. Somebody who has a heart that's crushed, a scorned person, meaning they've been cheated, abused. Uh, somebody who is afflicted by what's going on around them, and it's creating an internal hurt that creates an overthinking mind, that creates a victim mindset that can become a trap that you cannot get out of. We also invited the addicted Those that have substance or something in their lives that's getting their focus and getting their attention. We say this all the time. Matter of fact, it's a phrase that I've worked into every wedding ceremony that I've done since we walked into confession and into healing in our home and brought back. And we've said this, what gets your focus will get you. And if you're focused on you, you will do nothing but to satisfy you. If you're focused on the wrong things, then you will be led to the wrong things. Where your focus is, your direction is, all right? So let's get this. Worship defined is a focus. And so what you're focused on, you're worshiping. Some of us are worshiping the hurts of our past, and we don't mean to. You may be sitting there saying, well, I don't know how to get over it. And I'm going to be honest with you. I want you to write this down. Please get it. And we're going to use a verse of scripture outside of John to set this pretense. Hey, change is a process. Please write that down. Change is not instant. It is a process, meaning it takes time and effort. A lot of people want change and they want it right now, but it doesn't happen in the immediate. Look at, if you would, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number three, verse number 18, and we'll fire that up there real quick. It says, so all of us who have had the veil removed can, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Meaning this, you're not going to come to one service today and be totally like Jesus when you leave. But God can make you in this service more like God, more like Christ. And then when you get into your personal walk, he'll make you more like Christ. Again, when you go to celebrate recovery on Tuesday, he'll make you more like Christ. When you get in your small group throughout the week, he'll make you more like Christ. Don't expect one sermon to change years of behavior. It won't do it. But in John chapter number 11, we find where Jesus is now at the tomb of Lazarus. And today we're going to talk about Jesus and his relationship to Lazarus. Somebody tell me, when Jesus met Lazarus, his physical condition was what? 
dead. All right, can I tell you this? The Bible says that today, if you're living in a lifestyle that's outside of God and outside of his spirit, then you can be spiritually dead. Meaning that you are not experiencing the fullness and the goodness of God. You're not experiencing the abundant life that John 10 teaches us about, that Jesus came to give you. And so in there, I don't mean to look at you and say your life is worthless, but I'm simply saying this, any life outside of the life that God intended for you is worthless living, it is existing, it will not pay off in your life, and it will lead to more addiction and more affliction. Now, how many of you have a testimony of literal something that you can tangibly talk about, a substance or a lifestyle of addiction? How many of you have lived in an addictive mindset and an addictive tendency that you could represent today? Slip your hand up in the air. And I want you to look around. Hold them high. It's a testimony, right? You're not there anymore. Hopefully, you're in Christ. If you are there, good news. Hey, he still calls Lazarus out of the grave, all right? And so look around you. Hold your hands up. How many of you have had that? All right? They're everywhere today. I'd say that's 25%, 30%, maybe 40 percent of our auditorium. All right, can I tell you this? If you're honest with yourself, we all have addictions to something. All right, our mind can form addictions very quickly. All right, let's talk about this. How many of you drank a cup of coffee this morning? Come on, testify. He's got it in his hand. All right, how many of you? Some of you are like toasting it. I've got it right now. Raise it. How many of you had to have coffee this morning? Raise your hand. You know what happened? One day you got up. You drank a cup of coffee for the first time or maybe second time or first time in a long time and you had a good day. Your energy went up and everything. So your brain subconsciously said, that coffee made your day better. And so the next day, guess what you get up and do? You drink coffee. You go to Starbucks. Starbucks gets rich off your addiction, right? You know what that addiction is actually to? Caffeine. I told our teenagers this and it's very true. The two most legal drugs in America today are caffeine and sugar. And it is almost in everything that we got. And it's acceptable. I promise you say, there's no such thing. That doesn't have an effect on my body. Stop it today. Cold turkey and see what happens. How many of you have ever tried to quit caffeine? Yeah, next thing you knew, you wanted to slap everybody and you had a migraine. How many of you have ever quit sugar? I'll say this. And I, I told my wife this. This was a few years ago. I I cut sugar cold turkey one time, and literally it was the closest to withdrawing from alcohol I had gotten in my adult life. Physically sick, drained, nauseous, throwing up, lethargic, because that sugar had ingrained every bone in my body. You say, are you preaching on sugar and caffeine? No, I'm just trying to wake up the other 60% of you that said you're not an addict. All right, does that make sense? I'm just trying to tell us, it's easy, is it not? Matter of fact, what about this addiction? You told your children it's time for dinner. Nobody came. So then you raised your voice and you said, kids, get in here. It's time to eat. Everybody came. And you know what your kids subconsciously did? They learned that if you say it softly, they don't have to obey it. But once you start yelling, it's time. And you know what your mind subconsciously did? It realized that when you yell, you get results. So now what's the addiction? Yelling. You say, well, we don't live in a home that yells until it's dinner time, until it's time for bed. So it's time to take medicine and brush teeth. Am I right? Come on now. Anybody else there? Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad for it, but I am saying this. I believe the church has been in the grave way too long. I believe that God's intention, remember Jesus said at the beginning of this passage in John 11, that he will not die, but in everybody's mind and in everybody's eyes, he was dead. And when he showed up to the tomb, they came to him and they said, had you been here, he would not die. But one of them had the faith. Martha said, but I know you're here now and anything you ask God can do. And so today, we're going to talk about the Jesus that walks up to the grave and with a broken heart and an angry mind and an angry heart. By the way, guys, I couldn't get this off my mind. I'm going to give you a free message. Ready? Every man in the place, listen to it. Women, you may need it, um, but I'm not brave enough to tell you you do. All right? So here it is. Ready? Um, Jesus got angry. I literally went to Wade this week and told him, I have problems with my anger right now. Talked to DJ about it just yesterday. And, And you know why? I'm going to get to this in a little bit. You do not heal in here. You do not heal alone. And I learned in my past, three or four years ago, I bottled every emotion that I had. And now I realize that if I bottle it, it's like a Coke that's unopened. You shake it, you shake it, you shake it. And what happens when it gets open? It explodes. Some of you are ticking time bombs, skunks that spray and stink. You know why? Because you're holding it all in. And God knew you couldn't hold it. God knew you couldn't bear it. Your body wasn't made to contain stress. Your body wasn't made to figure it out. God put the cross on Jesus. Jesus' shoulders because it's too big for you and me to bear. Are you with me? 
And so I realized that if I want to change my lifestyle in the rest of my life, three years ago, I realized I've got to change my way of dealing with hard things. So you know what I do? I tell people. Now, I don't tell everybody, except for right now in this moment when I'm telling everybody online and you, but I don't go into the intimate details with everybody because I learned that not everybody can handle your healing. Some people will stunt it. Some people, like Mary and Martha, will wrap you up, throw you in a tomb, and put a label of dead on your life. You need the people that believe like Jesus, like, hey, I like it. The twin, Thomas, said to Jesus, verse 16 or 17 of this chapter, he looked at the guys around him and said, let's go die with Jesus. Let's go. You need a disciple that'll walk up beside Jesus himself to the tomb that you're resting in, roll the stone away, and declare and believe that you can walk out. And today I want to hear this and I want you to hear this and I want to echo this through the halls of this church. I want to echo it online. We are a church that believes that there's no such thing as a permanent grave when there's a live living savior. And if you today are in addiction and you today are in affliction, we are not going to be the church that labels you. We're going to be the church that stands in Jesus name and declares as Jesus did, Lazarus, come out. You've been in the grave way too long. Everybody else said, if we roll the stone away, he stinks. And Jesus said, get it off. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, the past 30 years of your life could have been terrible. The past five minutes of your life could have been the worst mood you've ever been in. You could have had the biggest fight and argument with your spouse last night. You could have come in smelling like alcohol and drugs today. Cocaine and heroin can be shooting through your veins. Your nose may still have the power, the powder lining the inside. I don't care how long you've been in the grave. And I don't care how much the world has told you you can't get out. And I don't care how dead you think you are. There is a resurrection savior that wants to pull you out today. And so today we're calling this hope part three. You've been in the grave long enough. You've been in the grave long enough. We live in a world that makes good money on creating addiction. And that's why most of your advertisements are sex or babies. They know that it will play to the emotional needs of your mind. That's why even, even peaches in a can are loaded with sugar. Because we know that if it's just peaches, you may not buy it. But the sugar in the water will keep you coming back. And we live in a world that has learned that if we can get you on pills, we can get you off of the pills with other pills. And so we will give you Suboxone to try to get you over what we got you addicted to in the first place. I stood with one of a friend of mine who used to be a really good friend of mine in a doctor's place who was battling Crohn's and sickness and could not stay out of the hospital. And I remember standing in his room when the doctor walked in and said, what I'm about to put you on, you will get addicted to, but we will deal with that later. The last sentence is a total lie. And the next thing you know, five years later, strung out on drugs. Still to this day, strung out on drugs. You know what? That doctor's nowhere to be found. And if he goes to a doctor, you know what they say? Let's give you pills made by the same company that made the last set. And so they profit on getting you addicted and they profit on getting you off of addiction. Come on now. Are you with me? You know, they get you profited on nicotine. They, you're nothing more than a number, right? Now you're saying you're preaching against these things. No, I'm saying this. I'm preaching against anything that can take control of your life that takes control out of God's hands and puts it into the substance or the creation of man. All right, now are you with me? Let's talk about porn. Porn is a billion, multi-billion dollar industry every single year. You know what the statistic is? 62% of men in the church, 61% of women are addicted to pornography. Now, I'm going to say this. It's got this mindset of you're not hurting anybody else. It doesn't affect anybody else, but there's studies that prove it changes the way you think, changes the way you respond. It even can change the shape of your brain. There's a thing called dopamine that goes off in your mind all the time. You know what dopamine is? Dopamine's the I like it. Let's just call it that. How many of you have ever taken a bite of a steak and all of a sudden you were like, oh, I like that? Your brain's firing off dopamine. Correct me if I'm wrong, DJ. You know what happens is certain things of this drug, like sugar, caffeine, cocaine, heroin, and other things, they take over the dopamine sensor. You know what Paul wrote, and it's still true today? No other thing controls your body like sex. It's sexual sin. And what your brain starts thinking is it can't have fun without it. And then the next thing you know, after long enough exposure, 
It hijacks the thought process to where it is mostly what you think about. And if you're the Mary and Martha, in other words, the friend or relative of somebody who's addicted and you're wondering why they don't love you enough, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the devil has hijacked their mind. He's wrapped it and bound it and he's placed it in a grave. Now I want you to hear this. There's nothing that Satan can create more powerful than the word of God speaking freedom into your life. So as we stand here today, can we agree that there can be freedom in this place today? I mean, I had hands raised just a little bit ago, but how about let's get a shout of praise to every person who has found freedom in Jesus' name. Can you do that? Yeah, it's there. All right, now look at at this. Go to John chapter number 11. Jesus told her in verse number 23, your brother will rise again. I thought that very appropriate today. I want to speak it to you, your sons, your daughters, your husbands, your wives, the people you love in Jesus' name can be radically changed at the name of Jesus Christ. You believe that? All right, look at this. Yes, Martha said he will rise when everyone else rises in the last day. She goes to the resurrection after Jesus ascends and comes back. She goes to the prophetic ending and and she says, I get it. Listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. Stop believing that your healing is coming and believe that your healer is here. All right. And she's saying, Hey, I know that's going to happen in the future. And Jesus is saying, Hey, I'm here right now. Matter of fact, if you read down, Jesus told her in the very next verse, I am the resurrection and the life. Would you say that with me? I am the resurrection and the life. Say it in a a way that we praise him. He is the resurrection and the life. It's not something you have to wait on. It's not something you have to earn. It's not something you have to figure out. Hey, Lazarus is laying dead and helpless, and you today may feel like you want out and you need out, but you don't know how to get out. And I'm going to tell you this, you're not going to get out on your own. You can't do it by yourself, but there's a savior at the tomb that's about to speak the words you need to hear and about to say the things that you need to know. And it's not about what you know and what you can do. It's about surrendering and right now being obedient to the voice that's going to call you from your grave. He is the resurrection, not your program. He is not your sponsor. He is not your church, not your pastor, not what your community thinks or says. He is, he is, he is. And let everybody else say you'll never let Jesus step in and the dead come to life. And today we need you to know that he wants you right now. It's not tomorrow. It's not the next day. And you may sit there and you may say, okay, I'm going to be totally delivered in this moment. No, you'll be totally changed and God will make you more and more like him each day. Don't come in here today expecting that every addiction you've had for 20 years is going to magically disappear. Can God do it? Yes. Yes, he can and he will, but you're going to get in the way. Because you're human and you have flesh. How many of you have dieted more than 20 times in your life? You know why it's more than 20? Because we quit more than 20 times. Am I right? How many of you have been free only to find the enemy calling you back? How many of you have been where you were so down and out and then all of a sudden a little joy came in your life and you got excited and you saw that God getting momentum. Your marriage started to change, but the next thing you know, there's another hit. It wasn't the same hit as before, but another. You know why? Because there's a flesh. There's a you, there's a me, there's people around you, there's an enemy that wants to get you. And today, understand that you cannot put your healing in the hands of another before you put your healing in the hands of Jesus. It doesn't work. And you may not want to hear that. You may want the 12 steps that will help you. And there are 12 steps that will help you. But none of those steps will help you until you know that the healer is not the step. It is the one holding your hand as you take the step. This is good stuff today, church. It's stuff that I wish at 18 years old somebody would have poured out in front of me. But they probably did. But Mike, many of you, I probably sat there and didn't listen. But I have prayed this week and I have battled Satan a lot this week. I have had my battles with those angers and resentments and my past being brought back up and things happening. Hey, I'll I'll tell you this right now. Before you go to battle and and fight what you think you're gonna fight, you're gonna fight in the battle of loneliness what the enemy's gonna try to do to keep you off the battlefield. There was a whole army of Israel that could have slayed a giant, but the giant was so big that an entire army stayed hidden until David showed up. And instead of thinking about the giant, he thought about the Lord. And I'm gonna tell you this right now. If you'll think about what God can do, the giant has no power over you. But if you think about what the enemy can do to you, 
you, you'll stay so locked up in your mind, so locked up in your home that you'll never leave. How many of you have gotten the flu this year? Raise your hand. It was awful, right? All right, now we're glad you're here. Hopefully you don't still have it, but we're glad you're here. But y'all remember how the world came out of COVID? Scared of a cough. Scared of a sneeze. Scared to actually even breathe the air somebody else was breathing. So we masked ourselves because we were so scared of catching something else, only to find that the mask kept out all the germs. And we thought that's a good thing, but our body needs to learn how to fight the germs. Because if our body can't fight the germs, it's going to be exposed at some point. And if our immunities haven't been built up, when the germs come in, they will overtake us because we don't have the immunities to fight it off. That's why they're now coming out and saying the masks were not effective. You know why? Because it might have kept you from getting COVID, but it also kept you from being healthy. And now that you're exposed, guess what? You're getting everything. How many of you have been sick after sick after sick after sick? My kids, this is the first time they've been in church in like two months. Thank God for that, by the way. We're celebrating that. But the thing is, is man, my kids, and we were the parents. Like, we don't want to get them out. We don't want to get them around. But then guess what? You're going to have to get back out there. We tell our overcoming grief class, which meets tomorrow at six o'clock, we tell them all the time, you may build a wall thinking it's protecting you, but the wall's actually keeping things from you that you need. I'm never going to let a man hurt me again. Boom, wall's up. Now you're never going to be loved again. Because while it's keeping the hurt out, it's also keeping the opportunity out too. The only way that they could conquer the certain armies in America during the independence war was the armies would go into their forts and their forts were so fortified that they couldn't take them down. So you know what they did? Surrounded it. And they didn't try to attack it. They didn't try to take it down. They just waited outside the walls to what was going on inside the walls became so desperate that they had to get back outside. You may think you can isolate and heal, but eventually you're going to have to get back out. And when you get back out, it's all going to still be waiting on you. So tear down the wall. Let Jesus be your shield and your protection. Let him be your, your, your guide. Let him be your shepherd. Let him be your Lord. And yes, you're going to have to face Goliath, but I promise you, we have a God that still takes the heads off giants. And today it may seem too big, but you can get there. Verse 26, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Man, what a question. If you believe in him, you can live. And we're not talking about resurrection of the dead, and he isn't either. He's talking about right here, right now. My prayer is that your marriages are restored, that the singles start dating again. Um, that, that those of you who have been hidden so long start letting God shape your abilities so that you get back out there. God's got more for you than a cold, dark tomb of loneliness and isolation, a cold, dark tomb of labels and other people's opinions. God's got life for you beyond this grave, and he's calling you to come out. Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. Then she turned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him and Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha had met him. And when the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hasty, they assumed that she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. Hey, I'm gonna tell you this now. For those of you that are hurting, it'd do you a lot better to run to Jesus instead of the graveyard of victim mindset. Instead of going back and saying, let me go over here and mourn, go to the one that can catch your tears, bottles your tears, and at the end of time has your tears so valued that they're presented to him as gifts when he has declared the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus had stayed outside that village, but in verse number 32, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up in him and he was deeply troubled. This is the message for the guys. Ready? Number one, Jesus got mad, but still did what he needed to do. Number one, finish the job. Don't quit. I don't know about you. When I get mad, I shut down. Anybody else? I either shut down or blow up. Where are you at? Where's, where's my skunks at? All right. You know what Jesus did? He could be mad. You can be mad, but don't, don't quit the job. Yeah, you can be mad at your wife, but don't you leave that house. Hey, don't, don't you abuse her. Don't you, don't you go after her. You can be mad at those kids, but, but don't you stop parenting and don't you start loving and don't you stop being there. You can finish the job. You can be mad. Finish the job. Number two, he didn't let it hinder the relationship. In other words, it's not over just because it made you mad. You know why divorce is so easy? Because we have such bad tempers and we are selfish. 
Now, if you're in an abusive situation, a lifestyle situation where they will not change, God gives you out. Are you with me? But if they are just making you mad, dig in. If they are just upset, you, you can still have a relationship with Mary and Martha, even though you're mad at them. That's what he proves. And number three, here, I love this. You can still be like Christ and have anger. All right? I don't know about you, but when I get mad, Satan starts to tell me how bad I am. And he'll rake my mind. Hey, there's three ways that you can still be like Jesus, right? That, that, that's the free one. That was for the men. Women, if you need it, take it too. All right? So it goes on and it says, where have you put him? He asked them and the Lord told him uh, and they told him, the Lord said, let's go see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. Uh, but this, the, some said, this is the man that healed the blind. Couldn't he have kept him from dying? Look at the next verse. Are y'all with me? I'm reading a lot of scripture today. All right, verse number 30. And I'm reading very fast. Three pages of notes. Now you just checked out, right? By the way, the more y'all tell me how long I go, the longer I'm going to see. I'm going to hit a record. All right, here we go. No, I'm just kidding. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. Here it is. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told him. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Some will say that you can't get up to. Don't listen to him. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you? You would see God's glory if you believe. Hey, Mary, Martha in the room today that has given up hope on something in their lives, it's your belief system that'll bring results. Not your effort system, not your ability system, your belief system. If you believe in God, you will see God-sized things. If you believe in yourself, you'll see yourself-sized things. And I don't know about you, but how many of you are not even good enough to finish your to-do list for today? How many of us are not good enough to make our spouses happy like we want to? Or to fulfill our children? How many of you want to be super dad, but you realize you're more Clark Kent material? Right? Didn't I tell you that you'd see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside, and then Jesus looked up to the heaven and said, I like this. Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. You know what I like? Jesus is so confident in who God is that it's not about, okay, God, I, me and you could just have a talk and this could happen, but let's have this talk out loud. Let's call it out so that if it doesn't happen, there's doubt in me. But I'm so believing that you're God that I'm gonna speak it because I believe that if I speak it and I let it be known, then we can see God do something here. I am so tired of modern day prophets in, a, in our world of Christianity. People that... They, that will say stuff like, well, I knew 9-11 was going to happen. God gave me a prophecy. Then where were you before it happened? Where was the message? Where was the call? Where was the willingness to, to make sure that not 2,000 people died? And so you were knocking on the door of the White House trying to get the message across that planes were coming. If God gave you a prophecy, it wasn't for you to tell us how godly you were after it happened. It was for you to try to stop it from happening. I remember when, when my fall became public, how many people say, well, I knew something was off. Then why didn't you try to help? Why didn't you step in? You're not more godly because you can pretend you knew something. No, 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 no. I like how Jesus said it. Hey, I believe you're going to do it, so I'm going to say it so that when it happens, they'll believe. Hey, how many of you believe that God can save your loved one? then start telling them that God's going to save your heart. You may be saying no, but Jesus is going to come after you. He loves you. He's going to heal you. And you say, well, I, I don't want to offend anybody. It's time for the church to realize that as long as we stay quiet, they stay in the grave. And it's time for us to step and say that your substance will not give you the high you're looking for. Your sex will not give you the permanent familiar, uh, uh, fulfillment that you're looking for. Your need of others' approval and opinions will never set you up for success. It's time for you to know that God has not called you to be dependent on others. So today, I believe in Jesus' name. You can get healing over your depression. You can get healing over the need of other people's approval. You can get fulfillment. And so right here in this place, if you'll open your heart and you'll open your mind, then God will radically change you. He'll resurrect you. And so for that, I say, in the next year, we will see people that may be some of your enemies standing on the stage giving testimony of the change that God has seen. We'll see marriages that we have given up on restored. 
And pro- let's give a prophesy that I believe that God is going to resurrect Jefferson County. And I believe he's going to do it through his people who believe enough to walk up to these things and say, you are not welcome here. It's time. We're going to get the person out of the grave and leave the graveyard behind. All right. In verse 43, then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, say it. Come out. Come out. Let's stop calling addiction a problem and start calling it a sickness. Let's go beyond a sickness and call it an attack. Let's go beyond attack and call it spiritual warfare. And let's go beyond spiritual warfare and call it demonic. And let's go and let's look at it and say this. That every act of evil that's happening on the face of the planet isn't because somebody's bad. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But what do we wrestle against, church? Hey, principalities. You know what that means? Demons that have spiritual authority in areas that God is not being taken. There's a prayer in the Bible in the Old Testament, where the angel shows up and said, I would have delivered this answer earlier, but for days I have been battling the principality of Persia. How many of you have done, anybody remember the Persian army in history? They were brutal. Um, Let's go, how many of you remember the Spartans? The hundred, all right, the 300. Who were they fighting? The Persians. The Persians were filthy. When I say filthy, they were ungodly in everything they did. I mean, rape was normal and allowed and okay. Slavery and cannibalism, torture openly. And if you were a believer, it was worse. They would put you on the tip of poles that were sharpened and let your weight impel your body over time. And they would use that as sport. And it would take you days to die. Well, they would mock you and watch you die because you had faith. They would skin them alive, pull them apart. They would kill the kids in front of the parents, the parents in front of the kids. And they were one of the most powerful armies ever known to exist on the planet. They killed more people than Hitler. Are you with me? They wiped, are you following this? And yet an angel, when delivering an answer to a prayer, said that it wasn't the Persians that were powerful. There was a demon that had principality powers over Persia that was so powerful that when that angel was bringing the answer, he had to war to get there. Don't you start thinking for a moment that the people around you are bad and start realizing that the people around you are in spiritual warfare and there are demons that are going after your children, demons going after your husband demons going after your wife and don't tune me out it's real and there's gonna come a day that God is gonna take every demon and Satan himself bind them and get rid of them forever there is no peace until they are gone do you realize that the Bible says that once we get to the end times there's demons that have never been loosed on the planet that will be loosed you know what that means it's gonna get worse you say you're trying to scare me I'm just simply saying this stop using suboxone to get the demon out and start using Jesus. Stop using willpower, pill power, abilities. It won't work. You need a savior. You say, my heart's broken. You need a savior. You say, I've been used, abused, cheated. You need a savior. You need Jesus more than you need anything else. And today we serve a savior that will call you out of everything that's trying to hold you back. And he goes and he says, and the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him, King James Version, loose him and let him go. Today, I want you to write this down, and we're going to go fast. Are you ready? There's four reasons why people have a difficulty in changing. Number one, they've had these defects a long time. He's been dead four days. That's a long time for a body to decay. Agreed? I don't have the embalming things that we did this. For those of you that are addicted and afflicted today, I want you to know this. You haven't been this way 
a short period of time, and it didn't, didn't just happen overnight. It took you some time to get where you are. That defect took some time to grow. Anybody else in here? I, I'll admit to it. Um, I find myself with a negative mindset sometimes. Anybody else? That didn't just happen overnight. That happened over time. Most people won't change because they've had that defect a long time. They start claiming things like, this is just the way I am. Number two, people won't do that because I just said it. They identify with their defects. I mean, when you see yourself in a certain way, you're prophesying, self-prophesying your future. When you start saying things like, I'm an overeater, you're identifying with your defect. Are you with me? That's why I don't like AA, N-A. Now, I like the, the fact that they're trying to get people up. Don't get me wrong. But I do not like the fact, and I've shared this with you before, so I'm not going to stay here a long time. Stop sitting around a table and telling people, hi, my name's Josh, and I am an alcoholic. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you are an alcoholic, it's current in your life. Stop being something. If you want to change, stop identifying with the defect and start identifying with the Savior. I used to be an alcoholic, but now I'm a son of God. I used to be a, a, a person that, 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 that had extramarital things, but now now I'm faithful and I'm loyal because God has changed my heart and changed my life. Stop identifying with the defector and start identifying with your savior. Yeah. Start letting them know who you are, but most people won't change. I'm, I'm a workaholic. I'm an overeater. I am this. I am that. What are you saying you are? That's keeping you the way you are. I'm addicted to, hey, the power of life and death is where? Come on, church, you know this, say it. It's where? The Bible says your tongue is a little thing that can start a huge fire. Your tongue is like the rudder on a ship that determines the course of your life. Your tongue, your tongue, your tongue. What you say about yourself is where you're pointing yourself in that direction. Stop telling your kids they're bad and start telling them their behaviors are. Hey, don't say you're a bad girl. No, 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 you're not a bad girl. And we won't let you be a bad girl. But what you just did was bad, and this is how you do it right. Hey, we're not going to let you stay here. We're not going to stand by and say it's okay to stay quiet with your affliction and your addictions and your pain. No, start letting it out, but don't identify with it. Yes, you've had it a long time. There's a quote I always say. I like this. Please write it down. I'm a product of my past. Everything in my past is shaped and defined me. That's the first part of the quote is I'm a product of my past. You ready for this though? But I don't have to be a prisoner of it. How many of you have heard, an apple don't fall far from the tree? I had somebody to say that to me um, when I was wanting to get engaged. And they, my, they knew my story. They, they knew my dad was abusive physically. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because my dad hasn't abused me in a long time. And I'm still praying for radical change in their lives and their relationship. And so let's not speak to what it was. And let's start speaking to the hope of what it can be, right? And so um, in there, they looked at me and they said, well... The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In other words, they were implying that I was going to beat my wife. That I was going to be like, I know your story and this is how it's going to be. But I determined in my life a long time ago when the punches were hitting her, my mom, and the punches were hitting me, that my kids would never fill my fist and neither would my wife. And I don't care what somebody says about the apple falling from the tree, but the truth is, is I can fall off that tree and roll as far away as I want. And I'm going to tell you right now, you may be a product of your past, but you do not have to be a prisoner of it. Stop saying you are the way you are because your daddy didn't and your daddy did. Stop saying you are the way you are because your husband did or didn't, your wife did or didn't, and start saying this is who I'm going to be in today. In Jesus' name, I declare a difference. I declare something new. I declare a new path, a new way. In just a moment, I'm going to give you the ways to do that. But we have a lot of people today that are so identified with their defects that they, they feel like that's where they're going to be forever. You are not a prisoner today. The cross set you free. Number three, you know why they don't? This is true. Every defect that is a habit in your life has a payoff. You drink coffee for what reason? Now, I'm not saying coffee's a defect, but work with me. To feel good, caffeine, somebody said to wake up. How many of you even got a shirt or a coffee cug that says, don't talk to me until I've had my coffee? <laughs> By the way, it's not a habit of your life. It's, it's not giving you some type of reward. You won't keep it around if you don't profit off of it. Right? 
If you've started a business and the business is losing money, what should you do to the business? Sell it? Change it? Close it? That makes sense? Are you with me? Some of you are saying, but this is, this is my dream. This is my passion. Great. Have good dreams and good passions, but don't go broke and, and, uh, and don't lose everything trying. If it ain't working, start asking God why it's not working. Maybe you're in a place that you're not supposed to be. Right? And by the way, money is the worst reason to start a business. You'll lose it before you'll make it when starting a business. You know what's a good reason to start a business? Passion and need. Everybody makes a lot of money off of meeting the needs of others. If you are not passionate about it, don't do it. How many of you follow this? And most people won't do it unless they bring a reward. We don't keep something in our lives. I mean, matter of fact, uh, let's put it this way. Whatever's being repeated is being rewarded in your life. So you're just like, why are my kids constantly like that? Or are you rewarding bad behavior? Does that make sense? Are you, are you allowing them to be totally disrespectful to you with no consequence? Are, are, are you grounding your teenagers? Well, I don't want them to not like me. They're not going to like you no matter what you do at some point in your life. You know why? Because they're human and humans want independence, right? You can have the best boss in the world, but some days you're not going to like them. You know why? You're human. And some days you're going to have yourself on your mind. And when you're a teenager, we've all been there. What's on your mind? You. And you know what? God designed it that way. Because your, your body's changing. You're chemically changing. You, you, gotta, you gotta learn yourself. You gotta learn your abilities. You gotta learn your talents. You gotta learn. By the way, you stop learning, you start growing. And if you stop growing, you stop succeeding. And, and what happens is we're saying, I don't want them mad at me, so I'm not gonna have the grounding. I'm not gonna have the time out. I'm not gonna do these things. And we reward that bad behavior. And guess what they do? They repeat it. Last time they went to Walmart, they laid down in the floor and they screamed and you bought the toy. So what do you think's gonna happen next time? That they're going to go in there and say, Mom, I'm sorry for what I did. Canaan's the queen of this. Dad, I'll never do it again. And I'm like, you little liar. I don't say it. <laughs> but I've heard her mom say to her, and I hear that all the time. And yet you still do it. So you're not going to get this. She'll fake cry and she'll go to her room and she'll slam the door and she's too little to be able to open it so she doesn't like that. She'll shut it and next thing you know she's knocking on it. Let me out. We didn't put you in there. You know what? God gave me a whole message on this. Maybe you're trapped in an area and blaming others that they didn't put you in. You put yourself. Right? And maybe you're blaming God for an area of your life that God had nothing to do with. You did yourself. You didn't pray about it. You didn't seek him about it. You just bought it. And now you're wondering why you're broke. And you're saying, God, you did this to me. No, he didn't. You went in and slammed the door and you forgot to realize that the doorknob's too tall. You can't get out, right? Are you with me, church? Hey, come on now, listen. If it's being rewarded, you repeat it. How many of you love pickles? Raise your hand. All right, how many of you are going to join me, the non-pickle, their gross club, right over here? All right, exactly. The smart people in the room, there's very few of us. All right, but anyway, listen, ready? Here it is. Hey, I don't like them. So you know what? If somebody says, do you want pickles on your hamburger? You know what I say? No. And when McDonald's does it anyway, they ruin my day. <laughs> and it's not just McDonald's. All right, it's all of them, Chick-fil-A. Listen, I don't like pickles. I have to be in the mood for pickles. It's almost like I have to be pregnant to win a pickle. And a guy can't get pregnant, but that's okay. <laughs> the only time I eat pickles is when I'm dieting. And you know why? Because most of the foods I eat when I'm dieting have no taste, and a pickle makes you pucker. All right? It's like, it's, it's there. Here's the thing. I don't buy pickles ever unless they're on a grocery shopping list. I never walk into the store and say, where's the pickle aisle? You know why? I get no reward from it. But you know where I go every time I go in the store? The deli. And I don't go to the meat side of the deli. I go to the walking in the winter wonderland this time of year where there's peanut butter rolls on white chocolate and Buckeyes with all these things in it. And I walk through and I look and I'm like soft cookies and hard cookies. Why? Because there's a mental reward in my mind set up for if I eat those things, not pickles. Understand this. Bad behavior gets repeated because it's getting rewarded. And if you don't want that, then you got to cut off the reward system of your bad behavior. You know what that means? Church, listen to me. Stop enabling the people in your life that have addiction. Stop propping them up. Start saying no. 
I recently had a lady come to me and ask for money. I am a softy. I am a very big softy. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. We, it, 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 it's a bad thing at some points in my life that I want to help everybody. I have to remind myself that this, and I want you to get this too. By the way, God's a big enough God that he doesn't have to hurt you to help somebody else, all right? But in my mind, sometimes I'm like, I want to give, 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 and if I don't give, they don't help, and then I'm not being the hands and feet of Jesus. Can I tell you this right now? If somebody is misusing the help, you're not helping. And so this person comes up and says, I need this. I need a material thing. And I'm like, well, we don't have that. And they said, but I need it. I need it. I got to have it. Why don't you give me cash and I'll go over here and I'll buy it. I said, I don't give cash. It's not going to happen. Well, can you give me a gift card? No, but I can go to the store and buy you one. Okay, no thanks and drove off. You know what it is? They didn't need the thing. What did they need? The money. You say, why? We are not supposed to figure out why. You know why some of us are so freaking out over what everybody else is doing? It's because we're wondering why. God is in the why, not you. God is the healer of the why, not us. We just need to figure out that, hey, sometimes no is the most healing answer we can give somebody. Sometimes no is the best thing that we can do. And say, you say, well, there's bad behavior. You're getting reward. We don't do things that's not rewarded. If you don't figure out what your payment is, about, by the way, you'll, you'll sit there and you'll wonder, eh, 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 let's put it this way. How many of you have learned that a lot of times when it comes to sin, the reward is not worth it? It's temporary. Yeah. I know we're talking to Lazarus today, but how many of you have ever been drunk and realized that the next day the reward wasn't good? How many of you have ever withdrawn and realized the reward of that high was not good? In the moment, it's all you could think about, but the next moment, not only do you have the physical attribute, it's the regret, it's the guilt, it's the shame. There's a psychological effect too. You gotta cut off the rewards. The rewards aren't worth it. Number four, you know why? Defects are so hard is because we become very comfortable with the lifestyle that has them in it. And it's scary to change. You know why? Satan fights change. How many of you have ever tried to change something in your life only to be met with every hardship you could think about? Let me, can I tell you this? Um, Satan will use fear to make you feel like you can't live without it. Ladies, listen to me. If he's beating you, I, I was on the phone with a client the other day. I don't know how we got on this talk. Didn't sell him a house, but we had a really good talk <laughs> on the fact that um, we're living in an abusive economy situation. You know our government makes $77 billion off of credit card debt every year? Let me say that again. Our government makes $77 billion off of credit card debt every year. That's the government. The banks make five times that. You know why when you're 18, they tell you you got to have a credit card to build credit? It's not for you. So they can profit off of you the rest of your life. If you got a credit card debt, pull it out and look at how long it's going to take you to make a, the minimal payment. If you got $20,000 of credit card debt, and I don't want to depress you, but if you look at the minimum payment, you got 33 years before that thing's paid off. 33 years. A third of your life if you live to 90. It's going to be spent paying off that credit card debt. Does anybody sit you down when you're 18 and tell you that? Or do you get every single credit card company shooting something into your inbox as soon as you turn of age to be able to get a debt? If you dig out of your credit scores right now and you make them better, you get in the 600s, high 600s, 700s, 800s, it will be daily that a credit card will show up in your mailbox. An offer, 0%, change over here, why? Because they profit off of you. It is modern day slavery and we don't even recognize it. It's to keep us addicted to them. Now I know this isn't popular, but I'm gonna tell you this, we don't talk about it enough in the church, but some people have an addiction to things and to spending and to having and to holding and to hoarding and to being, and you go in their rooms and there's stuff they never use. You go in their attics and there's stuff they never use. I have that problem in my own home. So where there's a lot of items I don't wear in my own closet. Any Me Too's in here? Hey, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you owe and owe and owe and owe, there'll be a lot of times you'll have to say no because you cannot go. 
We're living in a world that's drowning and dependent on other people for their money. And that is a dangerous place to be. And you know what Satan does? He makes you think that you can't live without them. You can. You can. And you can have freedom. Who's the debt free in the place today? My hand ain't even going to up. Who's debt free in here? All right. Do you love it? Do you have freedom you used to not have? I dream of it. I do. How many of you think today your life would be totally different if you had no debts? Yeah. Yeah, but are you going to have to go in debt to get a house? Yes. Are you going to have to go in debt to get a car? More than likely. Are we saying that that's a bad thing? But I'm simply saying this. There are people that are profiting heavily off of the lack of education in people. Satan will make you think you cannot live without something. And now in the whole conversation about that brought us back to abuse. It's an abusive mindset to make you dependent on something else in order to have freedom. That's how an abuse victim stays trapped by their abuser. You ever known somebody that's been beaten and battered and you ask them, why won't you leave? It's because they are groomed to believe they cannot live without their abuser. My dad used to deflate the air in the tires. He used to have the only credit card or debit card to the bank account. He would unplug the phones back before cell phones from the wall when he would leave the house. You'd go out and the gas would be totally out of the vehicle and the tires would be totally flat, meaning that if my mom wanted to run while he was gone, she couldn't. She was totally dependent on him. I'm telling you this right now, in the modern day church, we have an enemy who has made believers of Jesus Christ feel like they are totally dependent on the world instead of on Jesus. You are being spiritually abused today. You are being spiritually lied to. And there's a savior that says, come out. Let's be real. Now, this isn't a popular sermon, is it? It was until I started talking about money. The only thing I need to do to totally kill this message is bring out an offering plate. (laughs) Am I right? But the truth is this. If you were financially free, you'd be free in other ways too. Now, can I say this? Do banks have a purpose? Yes, do you need, yes, the the great institution. Can you make money on the bank? Yes. We have very good people that are in our church that are honest in their banking. They're honest in the way they do business. They'll tell you this is bad for you. And that is a good thing. Matter of fact, if your banker never tells you no, you need another bank. If your financial advisor never tells you no, you need another CPA. You need somebody that's going to stand in your way and say this isn't bad. Satan's going to attack your weaknesses every single day of your life. So we got to move this. Here it is. Write these down. Here's some ways that we can get free. You ready? Number one, you got to change the way you think. I'm going to give you some references. I want you to write these down. You're going to do a Bible study later. Ready? Ephesians 4. Pop them on the screen while I go. Ephesians 4 verse 23. All right? Ephesians 4 verse 23. It says, let the spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. All right, in verse 17 and 18, he tells us to stop thinking the way that the world does. You're not gonna live like the Gentiles do. Instead, you're gonna live the way that God teaches you. If you live like the Gentiles, the world, you're gonna be hopelessly confused because the world will say they love you and offer you no love at all. Romans uh, Romans 12, verses one and two. Verse two says, but don't copy the customs and behaviors of the world. He says, let God transform you into a new person by what? Change the way you think. Hey, Lazarus, if you're going to get up, it's not going to start in your behaviors. Stop. Hey, now I'll tell you this. We have, and I'm so thankful for Pastor DJ, we have a flaw system if we believe that we will change people's addictions by attacking their behaviors. Your behaviors will not change you. Your thoughts will. And he says, hey, let's transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It doesn't mean you're changing your mind. It means you're changing the way you process. All right, you're you're, you're starting to think things through. You're starting to ask questions. We have a Holy Spirit that'll do that. It says, then we will know to learn to know God's will for you. Say it with me, which is what? Good. What else? Pleasing and? You know why it's good? You're living the way that God wants you to live. You know why it's pleasing? Because you're pleasing God with the way you live. And you know why it's perfect? It'll fulfill you. God gets something and you get something. And when you both are benefiting, so are the people around you. 
Hey, you want to start changing your mindset. In other words, it's like this. You are not a victim. You say, but you don't know what they did to me. You're right, I don't. But you're not the victim. The victim of every sin is not you. It's God. Are you with me? Now, do you get the effects of it? Yes. But if you stay in a victim mindset, will you ever change? No. There's a lot of people addicted to victim. A lot of people addicted to the way that that thing is going. So we need the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19. Are y'all with me, church? For the wisdom of this world is what? Foolishness to God. Matter of fact, if the world thinks it's smart, God says it's stupid. That's what that Bible verse is saying. The wisdom of the world is dumb to God. Stop believing the world and thinking that they want you to change. The world doesn't want you to think. They want you to respond. Because the thinkers have the power. And if you refuse to think, you're surrendering the power to the ones that do. And so God says, make your mind mind. Because if you make your mind mind, you're in control of your life. If you're believing everything else everybody says, then they are in control. And we need to raise people that are not sheep. When the world says it's acceptable and the majority believes it, go to the word of God and challenge it. Because most of what the world says is right is wrong. That's why we're a non-conforming church. You know what I mean by that? I do not have to agree with your lifestyle to love you. I can disagree with decisions you're making. You can disagree with my lifestyle and still love me. But to love you does not mean that I have to let go of what I believe in. So we can still stand and say that certain things are sin. Certain things are right and certain things are wrong. You say, well, I need the Holy Spirit to help me change the way I think. How do I do that? Real change occurs. And number two, when you learn the truth, you got to change the way you think, but you can only do that by learning the truth. Look at John 17, verse 17. It says, make them holy by your what? Truth. You know when Jesus is paying this? Right before he goes to the cross. He says this prayer for his disciples. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is what? truth. Real change only happens when we learn the truth of God. In Ephesians 4 verses 14 through 15, we find these verses. It says, then you'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. By the way, if somebody's trying to convince you, you got to ask yourself why. All right, listen, I don't have to convince you that Jesus works because I've already convinced myself that Jesus works. I'm going to live on him whether or not you live for him or not. And I'm going to believe that what God does in our lives will prove to you that God works. That's why Jesus said, I'm going to pray this out loud so that they can see it's true. Hey, you just keep living for God. But if somebody's constantly trying to convince you about somebody else, question why. Stop sitting there and believing everything you hear. Are you with me? I find out more about my life from other people than myself. And most of what I find out about other from other people isn't even true. Have you found that to be the case? You know how rich I've gotten off the church? I didn't know it. Somebody in the community told me I was rich off the church. And then I, I wanted to pull my credit report and say, look at my debt. Yeah, you say, you say, what do you mean? Hey, listen, people will try to trip you up. But the main thing is this, people try to get you to doubt God. Try to get you to doubt that it works. You need to learn the truth. Verse 15 says, instead, we will speak the truth in what? In love. By the way, it's not love if you're telling somebody else's truth to somebody else. It's only love when you're going to the person that needs to hear the truth. He says, hey, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way. Here's that process again. More and more like who? Who is the head of the body, the church. Hey, it requires knowing God's truth. I, I, I wrote this truth in my, in my notes here. Behind every self-defeating uh, behavior is a, a lie that someone's believing. Would you agree with that? Can I give you a, just a quick lie a process that you can think? Um, you're being lied to about yourself most of the time, aren't you? 
I mean, if I were to poll you today and say, how many of you think you're a poor person or a pitiful person or how many of you think you're ugly or how many of you think your nose is too big or how many of you think that, that you sound stupid when you put out your opinion or how many of you think that, that you can never be good enough, there'd be a lot of hands go up in the place if we had a place of honesty. And the truth is we're believing lies about ourselves. We're believing lies about other people. We're believing lies about the Lord. We're believing lies about the world. We're believing lies this. Hey, behind everything in our life that is tripping us up is a lie that the enemy is telling us. In verse uh, 16 and 17 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says that he's going to teach us what is true. He's going to show us what is wrong in our lives. Look at this. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable, useful to teach us what is number one, right. Number two, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives, to expose what's wrong. Number three, to correct us and expose how we can get it better. And then number four, so that we can stay living right. Look at the next verse, verse 17. It says, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every work. I'll say this, you ready? It's gonna be big and it's gonna be hard. I want you to grab it. If your life is not changing, you are not in the word of God enough. And the truth is this, if you are stuck in the grave, you are not believing God's word. You're believing everybody else's. You're saying, why can't I change this behavior? You're not learning the truth. You need, number one, to change your mind. You need the truth to change your mind. The Bible says in John 8, if you know the truth, the truth will make you what? Free. And a lot of people are saying, change your behaviors, and then you'll change your mind. No, your mind affects your behaviors. And so what this, watch this, and I want you to understand it. We live in a world that says, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. And God says, learn of me. Come to me and learn of me, and I will give you rest. The trick to overcoming something in your life is to learn God's truth about it. Can I tell you this? God will tell you everything that sin will do to you. His word will show you what the bad behaviors will do. His word will show you what the drugs will do. It'll show you what the sex will do. Number three, real change requires us to clean house in our lives. I understand this. I got to change my mindset. I got to learn God's truth, but I got to clean my heart. If you want a, a, a healthy body, then you need to get junk food out of your house. Agreed? All right. If you want a healthy mind, then you need to rid your mind of some of the clutter. Um, by the way, can I say this? If you want a healthy mind, maybe it's time to unsubscribe to certain magazines, or maybe it's time to block certain channels, or maybe it's time to get rid of your computer. If you want a healthy mind, you got to do some house cleaning. And you got to get the things out that keep your mind this. If you're an anxious person, stay off the news. All right. Matter of fact, can I say this? Can I go a little further? Get rid of your social media. It's like, oh, can't live without it. I've lived without it for three years and I don't miss it. And every now and then somebody will send me a screenshot of the social media and my mind will be drawn back into the drama that I've been free from. Can I get you this right now? If you right now find yourself overloaded and, and you feel like the world hates you and you feel like all this, you need to get offline. You know why? Because you're, you're gonna look for validation in the wrong places. It's time to clean some house. If you want a clean heart, you ready for this? Confess. It's time to get it off your chest. Hebrews 12 verse one. Therefore, since we're surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Number one weight that'll slow you down, your secrets. The things that nobody knows. Hey, I, I, uh, I think it was in my Monday night class. Correct me if I'm wrong. I told him, I'd rather you call me when you're thinking about shooting up than after you've done it. I get a lot of calls from people who are high and drunk saying, I want to get off drugs and alcohol, and I'll help them. We'll do that. But you know, it's easier to help you if you'll call us saying, I'm thinking about getting high. I'm thinking about getting drunk. It's easier to help if, if you'll tell us you're thinking about suicide. Don't make us read about it in the paper. Past three years, we've had three people that go to this church die as a result of suicide. Two of them, one was a murder-suicide, and, and, and they sat on the back row of this auditorium within the past three years. Extended church, we know of five people who have killed themselves. world will call an overdose uh, 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 just an accident. What they don't realize is some people overdose on purpose. Often. You know, if you're in chronic pain, physical pain, you're a high risk of suicide. 
If you're in a high stress job, you're a high risk of suicide. You know why we have an enemy that knows to stake your influence is to take your life. And that's why he even took Jesus to the top of a temple before Jesus started his ministry and said, jump. And if you think you're not going to get that temptation, I'm telling you right now, you have an enemy that wants to see you dead. You need to pick up the phone. Confession is not good for the Lord. He already knows it's good for you. The most free you'll ever be is secret free. Some of you may have cheated on your spouses. Tell them. You know, you said, well, uh, uh, what's going to happen? Well, you just went back to the four reasons people don't change. Satan attacks it. He comes with fear and says, if you tell them, they'll leave. And they may. But the truth is, you'll be free and you won't have to go to bed. I'm like, you're going to get caught every time you turn around. If you're a secret drug addict and a secret alcoholic, and you may believe those don't exist. I was one for years. Talk to somebody. You, hey, don't talk to everybody. Don't get on Facebook asking for help. Don't get on your Instagram asking for help. Go to God. Go be a Martha. Hey, I don't want this in my life. And, and you could deliver me, but you're here now. And, and yes, it feels like this is dead. But you're still God. And you can do whatever you ask God to do. It can happen. And I believe that. And I believe today that we have teenagers that are trying to end their lives before they ever start. We have cutting epidemics with people taking razor blades and cutting them. And that's not just exclusive to our young people. I know many adults that are in there. Hey, understand this. And if that's you, understand that the only time we see cutting in the Bible is when a demon is present. When they're praying to a false god and he won't burn their offering, they start slicing themselves. When the man had a demon and breaking chains, he would cut himself. The kid that had a demon would throw himself in the fire. If you're wanting to self-harm, you have an enemy trying to kill you, pick up the phone. You don't have to do this alone. Matter of fact, our church does more with recovery than any other thing. And I pray that we die doing more for widows, orphans, and recovery than any other thing. You know why? Because I believe today that too many people are trapped in tombs. They're bound. And the only way they get free, I love this, Lazarus could not free himself. Jesus looked at the people, the community around him and said, lose him. That leads to number four. If you're going to change, you need a healthy community. Have y'all ever watched football? Is Andre still in the room? Andre, come on stage real quick. I want you to stand right over there. All right. Um, is Ethan in the room? Ethan, come on stage real quick. All right, Ethan, stand beside him. Question, who would you rather tackle? <laughs> right? Now, Ethan's way younger. How old are you, Ethan? That dude is 40. That's not, <laughs> that is you. He just turned 40. It was a very emotional experience for him. He's still in black in mourning tonight, all right? But that's when Moses' life came alive, right? Um, some things in your life are easy to tackle. I'm not saying he'd be easy to tackle. This guy's scrappy. Have you ever thought something would be easy to tackle only to realize it was bigger than you? But some things in your life, you need a team tackle. You ever watched a football game where the running back has six people of the other team on them and they're still running? Matter of fact, I'll give Tennessee Titans a shout out. Derrick Henry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He came from Alabama. But anyway, <laughs> he's a beast. I mean, you line up against some things and you're like, let's go. You line up against other things and you're like, why are we in this game? Yeah. Like if I played for Austin P and they just paid a million one for me to come play Tennessee for homecoming, I'm going to line up against that 380 pound guy in my 165 pound frame thinking, why am I here? 
<laughs> you know, like, what, you want the quarterback? You can have him. <laughs> He's right here. <laughs> like, I ain't giving my body for this. I'm going to tell you this. I want you to get this. There's defects that have been in your life so long, you can't take them on by yourself. Um, and I want you to write it down. Pastor Chris taught me this uh, three years ago. When I was going to anybody and everybody for help, he said, stop, you need two or three people. <laughs> two or three people. You know what we call that? A small group. And this small group, if it's healthy, you can be gut-wrenching honest with them. You don't need people that are superficial with you. You don't need to be people that are all like, hey, what's up, Andre? Everything's good. Life is great. All right, good. And then he's like, man, I'm falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. And they're like, all right, man. And then they go over here to Garrett and say, well, I don't know why Andre's trying to act like he can serve the Lord, starting a ministry and bringing his wife in because he's got all these problems. He told me that ain't a small group you need. Matter of fact, David said he had friends that would come to see how sick he was just so they could go tell everybody else and gossip about him. You don't need those people in your life. You know what that'll do? That'll set you back. By the way, can I tell you this? God did not call Christians to be in the ministry of putting people down. Every verse in the Bible that talks about ministering to others is to help them up. We're to edify, we're to build up, we're to pick up. We should be able to walk through the doors of this church and find two people we can look at and say, dude, if I don't talk to somebody today, I'm gonna go home and end my life and not lose our job over it. If you're the mom in here, that it's been hard and your kids have just been going through all these things and bad behavior and you're losing your mind, you should be able to come tell somebody, if I don't get help, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out. But we've raised a generation of believers that are so unhealthy in their community that if somebody's sick shows up, they want to point out the sickness rather than showing the healer. Amen. And we need more nurses. We need more front office people. That you walked into the waiting room of needing help and they took you to the doctor and they said, hey, we've got a good doctor here. And our doctor's name is Jesus Christ. Our healer's name is a mighty savior. Our power comes from the throne of God. It is not what our church can do. We are not the best church in town because we're made of people. You don't belong here. Matter of fact, I have a problem with anybody that says you belong here. No, you belong in heaven. You belong in God's will. You belong in what God wants you to do. God doesn't want you stuck in your church. God wants you stuck in your faith. God doesn't want you established in where you sit on a Sunday morning. God wants you established in what you believe on Monday morning when things are hard. God doesn't want you stuck in a graveyard of life going through the motions and going through the routines and everything's dead and everything's nasty and everything around you is just all dreary and terrible. God wants you the person walking out of the graves and bringing the other people too. God doesn't want a church that's sitting quiet on a Sunday. God God wants a church of believers that knows what it's like to be called out of the grave, changed by him, and know that others can be changed too. You need a healthy community. Best thing that's ever happened in my life is people I can trust. And I cannot trust easy. That's one of my defects. You know how hard it is for me to trust God when I don't know how to trust anybody? It's a lot easier to trust God when you text a friend like Wade or DJ and you say, I'm very angry. And Wade's response isn't, oh, me too. Although it was a me too, but it was a more, I've been convicted about that too. And first John tells us that if we don't deal with that, we're calling God a liar. And I don't want to call God a liar. So you need to deal with that. DJ on the phone with me yesterday or the day before. He says, you need to call your therapist. Oh, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? You know what the devil does? No, it did. It was very good. You know what the devil immediate thought is? Well, they think you're messed up. And the truth is this. You do too. So why are you worried about what they think? You wouldn't have called if you didn't think you were messed up. They wouldn't have sent for Jesus at the beginning of the chapter if they didn't think Lazarus was messed up. My prayer is, is that we're bringing a church in on Sunday mornings that's crying out to God. Saying, hey, I'm tired of our young people dying. I'm tired of seeing the joy of our 13-year-olds disappear by 16, 17, and 18. I'm tired of seeing the innocence gone before they're nine years old. I'm tired 
them being so indoctrinated that they're learning to hate. We had Pastor Chris and us, we were sitting one day right here having dinner on a Wednesday night, and one of our teenagers walked by and looked at us and says, you bunch of socialist pigs. I'm like, what in the world? I was like, well, come, dial that back. Rewind that. Who told you that? Well, they told me in school that, you know, if you're this and this and this, then Number one, and I love how Chris said it. Let's talk about socialism. You're a smart person. You're studying. You're getting good grades. And all of a sudden, let's, 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 let's break that down. Let's say you get this good grade, and then everybody that doesn't study comes in and doesn't, and your teacher comes in and says, I'm going to take from your good grades and give it to everybody else, and everybody's going to get the same score. Is that fair? No, that's socialism. What? That was the next thing. What? And, and then the person wasn't in a bad. They were just being taught that. Thank God in five minutes they were set free. And they said, I don't even know what that is. Were they at fault? No. Hey, wake up, church. They're after our children. They're trying to turn our children against you. Why? Because you're the closest thing to God your kids should see. The way you live and the way you serve, you are an example of who God is. Your marriage is an example of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they want your kids to hate you because you are the introduction, the usher to the throne of God. And so they say, don't listen to your parents. Come listen to us. Hey, it needs to stop. And you know how it stops? A healthy community that says, hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We're not going to get mad at you because you called us that. Let's teach you what that is. If you want your grade you earned, yes, that's called Capitalism, success comes from what you're willing to do and the choices you're willing to make with the opportunities you're given. You know what that's called? Freedom. You know who gave us that freedom? Jesus. You say, well, what what do we need to do? I'm telling you right now, if you're a Lazarus, you need somebody else to cut the robes off of you that the world has put on you and that you put on yourself long enough. Some of you need Monday night just to hear that you're not a failure. That you're not your bankruptcy. You're not your divorce. You're not last night's fight. That there's no decision you've made that can't be turned. It can be changed. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. Huh? I might be in debt today, but maybe in 10 years I won't be. Why? Choices. Are you following this? Some of us are trying to tackle things that we can't. And then we're wondering why we can't get ahead. This fight's not yours. The fight belongs to God. Y'all know this one? I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Why? The battle belongs to you, Lord. Our church can't heal you. And our church can't change you. But I believe our Savior can. And as long as we have breath in our bones, we're going to try to build a community to where we can stand in front of you saying, your life can be different. Look at Ephesians 4. Y'all can sit down. Verse 25. Therefore, since we're surrounded, that's Hebrews 12.1. The next one says, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbor the truth. For we are all part of what? Look at verse 32 of that chapter. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Look at the verse 29 of that chapter. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be what? encouragement to those who hear them. You know what the Bible says? An honest answer is better than a kiss of friendship. Anybody can fake your friend. A true fan will tell you the truth. I don't ask my wife, do I look fat in this for her just to agree and and say, and, and I do ask that. She never asked me, but I'm always like, do I look fat in this? You know, how do I look? Role reversal, I guess. And, uh, I really want her honest opinion. Does that make sense? Like if something's hugging me like a girdle, I don't want to stand on stage in front of hundreds, maybe thousands of people in that. You say, oh, you're in your head. Yes, I am. And you get in yours too. That's why I go to her. 
Are you with me? I don't want to go to our elders, our deacons, and a business meeting at our church and ask them to vote on something and everybody just agree with me. That's the worst thing that could happen. You need the person that says that, that's not right. In their mind, they're thinking that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, but they're nice enough to say it in an encouraging way and saying, hey, you're in your way. I need the phone calls that say, you're going too hard, you're going too far, stop. You know what's even better than the person saying you're going too far, you're going too hard, is the person that says, let me take this. Let me help you. You need a small group in your life. But here is the biggest fight to that. We spend an enormous amount of energy pretending to be good. You need two or three Christians that'll tell you you don't look good sometimes. That you don't sound good, you don't act good. You need a small group. Number five, if you want to change faster, you may need a personal coach. In the recovery world, we call that a sponsor. My wife had a conversation with me last night about real estate. In real estate, I have a coach. In ministry, I have a coach. Well, my thing is, is I don't want to be mediocre. If I'm going to do it, I want to do it right. But I'll, I'll promise you, you want to accelerate your growth, get a coach. You need a small group, but you also need somebody who's going to give you precise things. My coach has accelerated me so fast in real estate that it's overloaded me. I've hit a wall of too big of decisions for me to make. You ever got there? And my wife came and said, what if your success is hurting you too much last night? And what if you need to step away from coaching for a little bit because you're going too far? Here, I'm going to say this. I want you to get this through your head. The number one actress that you love the most, actor you love the most, has a coach. The NBA player that, that you think is amazing has a personal coach, a trainer. Hey, Jesus had a coach, the Holy Spirit. The disciples had a coach. Who? Jesus. You need a personal spiritual leader in your head. You know the Bible gives us five different types of coaches you should find in the church in Ephesians 4. I mean, you can look at it later. Ephesians 4 verses 11 through, through 13 tells us that there's five different things. Apostles, teachers, pastors, evangelists. There's all these things, five coaches that you should go to. And their ability is to help you learn and grow and go. Learn, grow, go. Equip you to, to learn the things you need to learn, to grow in the areas you need to grow, and to go to the places you need to go. You say, I want to change, get a small group. Hey, be honest, be open, clean your heart, clean your mind. Yes, get your identity in check. Get the things right. But I'm telling you now, get someone that will get with you and walk with you on a daily basis. And number five, your change requires faith. I'm going to say this, and I, and I want you to get this very clearly. God rewards on beliefs, not behaviors. God responds to belief, not behavior. You can be a good person your entire life, still die and go to hell. Why? Because if you didn't have the belief, you didn't activate God. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. But with faith, anything is possible. What, what's Philippians 4.13 say? What's the first three words? Say it loud. You got to believe these things. Ready? Here it is. Lazarus, listen to me. You got to believe that you can change. That God can change your life. Not only do you got to believe that God can change you, you got to believe that it can get better. You got to believe that God can change my heart. God can change. It can get better. And then God can change my behaviors. I can be different. Do you think Lazarus came out of the grave different than he went in? Yes. Do you think Lazarus' life after the grave was different than when he went in? Yes. You don't know, you know want to know the number one sign of if you've given your heart to Christ, there's been a change in your life. There's been a change in your faith. I believe this. With his spirit and through his word and with right choices, my life can be totally different tomorrow than it was today. Look at Philippians 4.13. Put it on the screen. You got it? Say it with me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Loose them and let them go. You are not going to change until your mind changes first. 
You're not going to change until you learn what truths you need to learn. If you get pulled over on the highway and you tell them, I didn't know the speed limit, does that keep you from getting a ticket? Whose responsibility is it to know? Learn the truth. You're not going to change trying to, to, to do things with secrets in your life. You got to clean the house. You're not going to change on your own. You need a community. You're not going to change without coaching. And what good is a coach if you won't run the play? You know, the most discouraging thing to a pastor is to preach on something and then that week get a phone call from somebody and they say, well, I wish this and this and this is going on in my life. And I was like, I just preached on that this Sunday. You know, and, and, and I'm thinking to myself, go back and listen and apply and you wouldn't be in the place you're in today. Now, before I can judge them, how many times do you read the word of God, get up and don't apply it? How, much, you know, how many times do you hear the voice of God and you, and you don't respond to it? But understand this, you gotta believe that God can actually do this for you. And I believe today that there's no hopeless case. And I believe today that God will change you right where you are. Bow your heads and close your eyes. For those of you that couldn't hear, he said he lost his job and on the same day got two jobs back to back. But if you trust God and leave it in his hands, that God can do things, yeah. I want you to bow your heads. I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask, I don't know if anybody's in here that can play the piano, but somebody take it. Oh, yeah, there you are, Casey. Come do it. Yeah, Robbie wants to. Are you okay with that? All right, I don't know what you can play, Robbie, but go. And if it gets really bad, Casey's coming. I'm just kidding. Give it a shot. Go, buddy. Might have to turn it on. There you go. All right, turn it down. Y'all felt that power, right? Listen to me. Bow your heads, close your eyes. How many of you can examine your heart right now and you know, 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 you know. That you've got to change some behaviors in your life. That there are some things that are there that need to go. And I don't want to publicly expose you, and so I'm not going to call you to an altar today. But I will say this, if you need one, it's open. If you need somebody to pray with you and you need somebody, the Bible says if we confess our faults one to another, if we get to that confession stage, then God can heal us right here. But you're not going to come out of the grave pretending you're okay. And you're not going to come out of the grave just going through the motion. Those thoughts are still going to be your thoughts when you leave this place. And those challenges are still going to be your challenges when you leave this place. When you sign off of your Facebook, it is still going to be there. Unless you have a moment in your life that you say, I believe, I believe that my life was made to be more than this. More than this moment. More than this behavior. More than this affliction. More than this hurt. More than this pain. More than this addiction. More than this constant search of need, of fulfillment. And if that is you today... There's a Savior calling, saying, come out, come out. Whatever your name is, get up. The same Savior's looking at the church and saying, hey, loose that person and let them go. And I wonder how many of you are here today that say, and you will be bold and you will be honest. We'll skip right to that third point that you will say, I need such a change that I need to clean my house. And you'll admit openly right here that there's some form of an addictive behavior in your life that is holding you back from the purpose of which God's called you to be, holding you back from the happiness that God has for you. Is there anybody in the place today that says, I need deliverance from my addictions? Would you slip a hand in the air right where you are? There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five. Anybody else? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, 
16, 17, 18. There's a savior. The question is, do you trust him? Do you know him? Is he your savior? Can you recognize his voice? Do you know that he loves you? That he's came today with a sermon for you in a, a congregation of hundreds. He, he spoke to 20 of you to give you a chance to say your life can be different. And I'm going to tell you this right now. You're surrounded by people who've experienced that life-changing resurrection. They've experienced the power of God and what he can do. And right there where you are, would you pray a simple prayer? If you're not saved, would you say, Jesus, I give you my heart. I take you as Lord of my life. I believe that you gave your life so I could gain mine. And that today you're alive and because you live, you've offered me life too. Is there anybody here today that would say, today is the day I'm accepting him as my savior and my Lord. I'm giving my heart to God. Would you just slip your hand up? Anybody like that? Raise your hand. I'm looking around. Hold it high. Let's see. There's one. Anybody else? Hey, I'm giving my life to Christ. Amen. Can we celebrate with the one today? Is there anybody here today that's saying, okay, God, change the way I think. Help me change the way I think. My mind, my mind needs a savior. Is there anybody that slip a hand up with a simple prayer attached saying, God, change the way I think. Would you slip your hand? Hold it high. I want you to keep it up there. All right, I want you to keep it up there. Hey, look, if somebody's near you with a hand in the air, would you just put a hand on their shoulder right now? A head on their shoulder right now. And would you just say a prayer? You don't have to say it out loud. But would you just pray with them? Can somebody get down here to the altar with this guy right here? All right, can we pray with them and just believe right now that God is speaking words of healing and change? Can somebody get right here? If you're in the balcony, can you get right here? Back row, center, get right there. Where's my broken hearted today? Carrying the burdens and the weights of other people or the burdens and the weights of your own self. Where's the hurting, the depressed, the anxious, the stressed, the afflicted today? For so long, you have felt like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Would you slip your hand up? Is there anybody like that today? Saying, my heart is heavy. Slip it up. Hold it up. I want you to keep it there until somebody gets to you. And if you're equipped, I don't care if you're a visitor here. I don't care. You know, you just hold that hand. Would you just get to somebody? He's got a hand in the ear. Can I get a lady right over here? Somebody right over here. I believe we would come to church when we don't have to go to an altar or through a routine or a tradition, but when we see people where they are and we're willing to meet them right there, say, you're not alone. And you're going through this and you've gone through this long enough and there's a savior that wants to heal that heart. Through his spirit, through his word, and through your choices, things can change. Things can change. Let's give this moment just a moment. Is that reckless love? Can you get a mic? Robbie, you're doing a great job. Let's just sing a verse in the course of this. And I know it's after 12. And all week I told myself I was going to be shorter after last week. And maybe services could get shorter if the power of God was actually alive in us. And I'm not just talking at grace, but all across, Christians were woke up. 
we could go and challenge and we could do. We need a revival. We need a movement. Casey, I want you to just sing very quickly. Let's sing a verse and a chorus of this. And then we're going to pray a prayer of deliverance over these people. And we're going to challenge you to walk out. We're going to challenge you to get a group. We're going to challenge you to get in God's word. Because it will produce life if you are not changing. You are not in the word of God enough. And enough of the God's word is not in you. We've got to seek that truth, right?